All right, so I think we are <clears throat> ready to start. I'm a long ways away from all of you guys. <laughs> See, what county are you guys in? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm several miles west of there. I guess. Okay, well, okay, we're going to pick up some things here, a little review because we didn't get recorded last week, so we're going to pick up, kind of go back and do a little bit of review on that. But uh, since we got some other things to cover in chapter 12, but anyway, we didn't really get all of that done. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that you are so good, so gracious, so loving. And Lord, as we come together, we know that there's, there's a lot of concerns and needs in our heart. There's some physical concerns from those in our own midst. There's concern for the tragedies that have happened like that in Florida. Father, be with those families who are concerned about loved ones and all of those who are working to try to find answers and help. And Lord, we with this nation, in a spiritual sense, Lord, we need, we need return to you. We need revival and healing. Father, help us to grasp the depths of your word. Help us to rely on the help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the blessings you pour into our life. Thank you that we get to know you. Watch over us now as we look once again into your word. In Jesus' name. All right, Romans, or Romans, Revelation 12. Uh, <clears throat> I've, a lot of you have, were here when we went through this in the Cosmic uh, Conflict Seminar, but I really believe the first part of the chapter where we were talking about the woman adorned with the 12 stars, uh, the sun, moon, and under her feet, the moon under her feet, and the crown of 12 stars on her head, pregnant and cried out in pain, about to give birth, and then another sign appeared in heaven in the red dragon, the seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns. So that, that imagery, <clears throat> I really believe, fits an astronomical sign. And again, you can go to uh, a resource like the Star That Astonished the World, which I think is still free online if you are so interested. I put that in the resource material when I did the other seminar as well. Uh, and you can see that, that a lot of this, uh, I think, in this initial part, applies to that. Um, and I, do, I don't want to go through all of that, but just briefly the constellation idea of the, of the Virgo constellation, uh, which was used by the rabbis, by the Jews, uh, to talk about a coming ruler or king. Also in the Gentile world, that constellation was used to talk about that. But the sun being in the center of that constellation and the moon being at the feet or the bottom of that constellation narrows the window astronomically to about a 90-minute window. Uh, then when you, when you add in the dragon, the constellation, which is probably Hydra or Scorpio, one of the two, with that description, you come down to an actual date of 9-11-3 uh, BC. Um, that would astronomically pinpoint the time frame of when Jesus was born. Now, again, I mentioned here, did Daniel teach the Magi? I think he did. Uh, I think because his whole life was spent in Babylon, he was the ruler of the Chaldeans, who were basically the Magi. That's where they come from, because they were skilled in, in mathematics. They were skilled in looking at the stars and the skies. Uh, that was very prominent. So I believe that Daniel did teach them. Uh, I believe he taught them what the scripture said. And he was very much a prophet and very much involved in uh, the future aspect of certain things. And I think most of the book of Daniel is reflecting the coming birth of the Messiah. So I think he taught them. I think he left them his wealth so that at the time came when they saw all of that astronomical sign come together, they knew that, as it says in Scripture, that a king was born. This is it. This is the time. And then they began their journey some months later and probably would have wound up in, in uh, 
Bethlehem at what we recognize as 1225 or Christmas, which would not be the birth of his, birth of Christ, okay. but it would be the celebration of the Magi coming okay. to recognize his birth. Some year, year and a half later, uh, when they finally made their way there. So that kind of a, a brief summary. I believe they were familiar with that. Again, we've talked about this. The child, obviously, is Jesus. Um, and then we're going to go look at the rest of the passage here to tie that together as well. The dragon, uh, which we know is a symbol for Satan. The beast, those are all terminology for him. The fact that it's standing before the woman gives us another indication astronomically. Uh, and then the other, the other factors that figure into this is the constellation that's above Virgo is Leo, which is the lion. Where does Jesus come from? Judah, which is the lion. And that all ties into Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49. Uh, Judah's the lion cub. And from him... The scepter shall not depart from Judah. He's coming from the tribe of Judah, which is the lion. Well, the constellation Leo is the sign of the lion, and that all fits into the picture as well. It was the royal constellation, um, not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Uh, they also use that as their point of reference as well. Leo is dominated, this is interesting too, Leo is dominated by Regulus, which is known as the king star, and by Jupiter, the king planet. And that combination leads to a date of Jesus' birth. Okay? I just think all of those things kind of are fascinating because when you tie them together with what Daniel did in the time he was in Babylon, and with these things all together, I think you have kind of a an amazing picture of most most scholars, by the way, know that Jesus was not born on December 25th. Uh, they're all well aware of the fact that he was probably born in the fall, which 9/11, that's fall September, uh, would fit in with that. Jupiter is probably the best explanation of the star. I'm not going to go into all that. We went through this in the seminar: the retrograde, back and forth motion of Jupiter, and when it stops in connection with Venus, made it one of the brightest stars that you could see. And that was when the Magi then saw that, and it would have stopped on the 1225 day, it would have stopped its motion and given them this marvelous light, uh, and they would appear. Now, you say, well, what's, what's amazing about that? What's amazing is, <laughs> why did God put the stars in place in the first place, according to Genesis? For signs and seasons. Signs is also a part of this. And isn't it interesting that, uh, you know, sailors use the this, this sky, too, to navigate, don't they? Um, so anyway, all of that come together. Uh, the other factor that's neat about that is that 9-11, 3 BC, was the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Feast of Trumpets. What did they use that for? Inaugurating kings. And rulers. I don't know about you, I find this fascinating. All of that comes, and you say, well, wait a, minute, wait a minute, what about the miracle? The miracle is God created all of this, and he knew, <laughs> he knew when he put all of that in place, that at this particular moment in time, all of this will point to the coming of his son. Wow. That's pretty amazing. All of that would come together. By the way, what does Paul say in Galatians? When did Jesus come in the fullness or at the exact point in time when it was ready for him to come? <clears throat> wow. All right, that's all fascinating. I think uh, there's some of the pictures I put up there earlier about the constellation Virgo and uh, where Regulus is in connection to that. Leo is above that. Virgo and Leo, see Leo is above Virgo. There's the sun, uh, which will be in the wind. And there's Jupiter down there, and there's the moon. So all of that figures in astronomically to the time frame that we're talking about. And we did show the star of Bethlehem. All right, Rick, I think we're done with, with that part. I know it kind of went through that fairly easy. Now, 
Also, the other thing is chapter 11 and chapter 12 are some connection and coinciding of some things that we're going to talk about that link together there as well. Remember chapter 11 was talking about the measuring of the temple. Was it a literal measuring of the temple? No. 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 Why? The temple wasn't there. There was no temple. And John borrows this from Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 where Ezekiel goes into this long description about measuring the temple. Well, was the temple around when Ezekiel? No, he was in ex exile. What had happened to the temple? Well, it was destroyed by the Babylons, Babylonians, okay? So there was no temple then either. So what's the measuring of the temple mean? Well, it's got to be symbolic. And it is. It's talking about those who belong to God. Measuring implies uh, authority and sovereignty, protection. And all of that is a picture of the same kind of picture that the ceiling of the 144,000 was. The ceiling of the 144,000 told us that, well, those are those who what? Those are those who belong to God. What are we sealed with? The Holy Spirit is our ceiling. Paul makes that clear in Ephesians too. Um, so that, that all ties together. And then at the end of chapter 11, remember... That that's talking about the day of the Lord. When you get to verse 15, what's, what's sounding? Oh, the seventh trumpet. Well, now, did I mention last week about Paul talks about a trumpet, doesn't he? 1 Corinthians 15. The trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. That's coinciding with what John says right here. Also, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, Thessalonians 4. The Lord will descend with a loud shout and the trumpet call of God. Guess what? That all correlates. What Paul wrote, what John's writing, same thing. Seventh trumpet. What's happening? Seventh trumpet sounds. What's, it's over. It's over. Why? Well, because. Look at the reading. The kingdom of the world has become. It's now here. The kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ will reign forever and ever. It's there. In this vision, that's it. Seventh trumpet, it's over with. The elders are there on their thrones worshiping. You have taken your great power. You have begun to reign. The nations were angry. Psalm 2, the time has come for judging the dead and what? Verse 18 of chapter 11. Judging the dead and rewarding, rewarding who? The, the believers, the holy ones. Is there something in Scripture about rewards for believers? Well, uh, it seems to say so. And those, those are your holy ones and those who reverence your name and for destroying those who destroy the earth. It's done. It's over. Why? Well, look at 19. God's temple, it's open now. And the ark is there. What's that mean? Symbol of His presence. The ark was always a symbol of His presence in the holy play, the holy of holies, because the mercy seat was where God's glory believed to dwell. So the seventh trumpet there in the end of chapter 11 has sounded. And now we're going to get some more information through chapter 12, which John kind of really compresses. Because after this sign with the woman, and who do we say the woman stands for? Well, in small part, Mary, because she gave birth to Jesus, but in the larger picture, who would the woman stand for? Because look at verse 6. We've got the woman mentioned again. And she's now seen as pictured as fleeing into the desert. Well, so it's not just Mary. The woman is who? The church. The church. In the broader picture. The woman is the church. It's also Israel, though, because Israel was the means by which Messiah was going to come into the world. Yes, ultimately through Mary. But what I want you to see is the big picture. The woman is representing more than just... Mary, it's, it's pointing to who are God's people. Um, and I think if we have that up here, let's just look at this. No, not 13. I'm not ready for that yet. Oh, you want 12? Okay. No, no, that's fine. I just, haven't, I just haven't got finished with 12 yet. Because there's a few things here I wanted to go over. Let's just read a few more of the verses here. 
Okay, so we've got the dragon, we know who that stands for. We've got the child, we know that's Jesus. We know the woman, is the bigger picture is either Israel and or the church, ultimately the church. The child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Nope. What is that talking about? When was when did that happen? Well, when he was taken up to the throne of God, that was the ascension, wasn't it? So John's really compressing Jesus' ministry here. Not only is he talking about the birth, but he's talking about ultimately the fact that he's been ascended and taken up. Following that, we got conflict between the enemy, the devil, and the people of God. But then look at verse 7. We've got war mentioned. Um, back for a second to the image of the dragon. We know that in the Old Testament, the dragon is used to represent powers that oppose God. Uh, Egypt, for example, main one for a large part of the Old Testament. Then later you've got Babylon and Assyria. Uh, kingdoms that opposed God and his people. Uh, was often symbolized by that. For example, Ezekiel talks about Pharaoh being a great dragon uh, in Ezekiel 29, and verse 3. And then we didn't mention really much about verse 4, I think it was, where it says his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. That's kind of an interesting verse, isn't it? What do you think that is? Yeah, well, in, in the Old Testament, we talked about a little bit about this. Stars represent, usually, angels or spiritual beings. Now, they also, though, can represent believers. Uh, in the New Testament, you're going to have verse like th that talks about the believers shining like stars. So they can be a reference to angels or spiritual beings, and also it could be a reference to believers you got both of those things going on I think it's talking about this conflict where is this conflict taking when is this conflict taking place now a lot of tradition says that verse 7 especially with the, the war in heaven took place sometime before creation uh, the context doesn't really lend to that here because Satan appears to be able to have some ability to appear before God in the Old Testament. But when is this conflict taking place in the context of what John is saying? He's talking about the birth. He's talking about Christ's ministry, his resurrection, ascension. This conflict where Satan was finally and ultimately defeated took place where? At the cross. At the cross. At the cross. What did Satan think he was doing when he got him put up there on the cross? What did he think? What do you think? He thought he was winning, right? Why did he think that? Because the promise in Genesis 3.15 was that there's going to be conflict between Eve's seed, humanity, and the devil, the enemy. And so he knows that he's going to be crushed. Wasn't that part of the promise? Eventually he's going to be crushed by some seed from the woman. What does he want to do throughout the entire Old Testament? What is he trying to do? Kill Jesus. Well, prevent him from the seed from coming. Well, he knows there's going to be one according to the promise, so i got to stop that from happening. So if you read, and we did some of this through the Cosmic Seminar, he's tried down through the centuries to stop the seed from coming. How? Well, think about these different events that took place. Genesis 6 was a big one, wasn't it? With this intervention of the angels and corrupting all of humanity. His, his goal was just to stop it right there. And he would have, except for God intervening and saving Noah, right? Well, then what about Israel being chosen as a nation? Did he try to stop it then? Uh, yeah, what did he try to do with Abraham once he was called? 
Where did Sarah wind up on a couple of occasions? When they went to Egypt, she was in Pharaoh's harem. What's the big deal with, see we missed some of it. What's the big deal with her being in Pharaoh's harem? He can stop the seed right there. He corrupts her and brings her in connection with that hair. He, he stops it. But what did God do? He intervened. What did he try to do when Israel is enslaved in Egypt? What did the Pharaoh say to the midwives? Kill the boys. Kill the males. Put them in the Nile River. What did, how did Moses get saved? Oh, the same word that's used for ark when Noah built the ark and preserved his family is the same word used for Noah's preservation in the ark when the mom put him in the river. And he was found miraculously saved. God intervened. The Judah Tamar story is another one. We don't have time to go into it again, but all through history, Satan was trying to stop the sea. We need to get the big picture. One of the problems is people in Revelation is trying to nitpick the details to death, and that's not the way to do it. Satan was trying to end the sea. He, he, he thought when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, what did the Magi, they were looking for this king to worship him. Herod got the scribes together and said, what about this? And they said, what? Did the scripture say anything about it? A prophet named Micah said something about Bethlehem, didn't he? And he told Herod. And what did the scribes do? Nothing. Oh yeah, there's, there's this prophecy Micah made about king being born down in Bethlehem. They sat there, and the magi, pagans, from way off, go and find him and worship. But Herod tried to do what? Kill the males. You see the picture? All the way through, Satan is trying to stop the seed. But he couldn't. The seed comes. And the imagery of the dragon is his continual conflict with that spiritual conflict that's been going on ever since. Now the picture of the dragon's tail sweeping the stars, Daniel 8. Daniel 8.10. Let me read that. And the horn grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and trample them down. Now the application historically in Daniel was to Antiochus Epiphanes who came in and desecrated the Jewish temple and sacrificed the pig on it and killed priests and made a mess. And then the Maccabeans came back three and a half years later and retook the temple. But that was historically the picture at that time. Stars then in Daniel could refer to the believers in Israel who stayed strong, but it may also refer to angels or spiritual beings, so both are in play. Okay, I think the, the fact of sweeping a third of the stars means that there was this conflict going on at the time of Jesus' birth through his ministry, and there, there, there's going to be this continual struggle for who's going to gain power, who's going to win this, this, this war. But again, Daniel 8, what's John doing? Borrowing and alluding to Old Testament scriptures. Okay? The woman flees into the wilderness. What, what does that bring to mind? If the woman is, one, in one sense, Israel, what does that bring to mind then? Going down to Israel. Israel in the wilderness. For how long? 40 years, they're in the wilderness. Were they taken care of? Yeah, they had food, manna, they had on one occasion quail, which kind of messed them up. And they had water from the rock and their food did, and their clothes didn't wear out. God provided for them in the wilderness. That first illusion is going back. John borrowing the imagery of the Exodus and the wilderness wanderings. That was the key event in the Old Testament. It ties to our spiritual picture of being delivered from the bondage of sin. That's our wilderness. 
And Jesus took care of that, didn't he? Okay. You also have a picture of who else was in the wilderness? Jesus. Jesus was in the wilderness, but in the Old Testament, two prominent figures in the wilderness? Old Testament. Abraham. Well, true. But I'm thinking more of where did Moses flee when he left oh, Egypt? And went into the wilderness, you know, went to Midian. Elijah ran into the wilderness. Uh, you get, and where are they pictured? Oh, in chapter 11. Moses and Elijah are pictured in chapter 11 as representing the two witnesses. What's the two witnesses represent? The church. Because of the lampstand imagery. Lampstands talking about witness. Okay? So, fleeing into the wilderness, prepared by God. God's watching over them. And this war in heaven is what's taking place, I believe, at the time of the cross when all of this culminates and Jesus has got the weight of the sin on the, on, on, put up on him and there's darkness covering and Satan believes he's, he's finished it, he's got rid of the seed, but then Sunday comes, resurrection day comes, and he's, he's brought down, he's defeated and there's, there's no more opportunity for him to be our accuser anymore and drag us down through sin because Jesus has conquered it. That's the picture. That's the image here that's being portrayed. Because, and, and I don't know that necessarily this would be a physical war that we're talking about. I think as one uh, writer said, it's more like a courtroom scene. It's more like bringing the charges. Because what does Satan's name mean? Adversary. A, accuser. And so that's what he's been trying to do, is to accuse, to oppose, to be an adversary to us. And I think you've got the picture of Michael, who represents who? Israel, doesn't he? He's the chief prince. We've got this hierarchy in the spiritual world. Michael, again, go back to Daniel. Uh, and Daniel uh, 10, I believe it is, that talks about this conflict when Daniel was praying. And finally an answer comes, and, and he's told, well, I would have brought the answer sooner, but I was, I was hindered by the spirit of, of Persia, the, the prince of Persia, spiritual being. So there's this picture of spiritual conflict. Yeah, and Jason's been talking about prayer uh, for the last several weeks, and prayer is what? Well, it's spiritual warfare. When you gain, engage in prayer, you're engaging the enemy in spiritual warfare. And Daniel points that out very clearly with what he, what he highlights there in that. So... The great dragon was hurled down. I believe that was a culmination of what happened on the cross through the resurrection that ended his real reign of power. Now he's still roaming around. It's kind of like the difference between, uh, uh, to use a kind of weak analogy, uh, D-Day and V-Day in World War II. Uh, uh, D-Day was the Normandy invasion, right? Which historians tell us changed the whole course of the war because that spell the end of Hitler's uh, dominance and, and victory chances. But V-Day didn't come until when? About a year later do we get V-Day when the culmination is over. That's kind of the picture here. Satan was defeated, really, on when the cross happened, right? I mean, that did him in. But we haven't reached the final V-Day yet because Jesus hasn't come back yet. That's kind of the picture. I would use that. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient servant called the devil. Oh, who we automatically know that Genesis 3 is talking about the devil, don't we? Because John says so right here, doesn't he? Who is it? Well, it's, that, it's, the, it's the ancient serpent mentioned in the garden. That's the devil. Satan, who's leading what? The earth dwellers, the whole world. What's his purpose? Deception. Murder. Lying. How does he do that? Well, he works through world systems. John says he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of the world. And he works through all of those systems to lead us, what? Astray. He's working through the Islam teachings. He's working through communism. He's working through Buddhism. He's working through Hinduism. He's using all of those tools to push people away from God, away from truth. Does that make sense? 
He's leading the world astray. Then I heard a loud voice say, Now have come. Now have come the salvation. When? When that event ended. When that event happened at the cross, that did this in. That finished God's plan for salvation. Now have come the salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God. Remember Jesus' prayer that this kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. And the authority of His Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. He's constantly on us to accuse us, to try to do what He can to bring us down. Who's constantly doing, He's been done in. How did we overcome Him? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Has that been happening all the way down through history since the cross? Yes. Still happening today. That's how we win. Every time a believer comes to faith in Christ and being cleansed in the waters of baptism is a blow to Satan. That's part of our victory. Every time that happens. Why? Because he's after souls. He doesn't want you and I to be with our Heavenly Father forever. So that's how we overcome. That's how they did then. That's how we still do today. And they did so because they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink even from death. In other words, they're willing to die. Almost all of the apostles, except for probably John, died a martyr's death, the tradition tells us. Paul was probably beheaded, probably by Nero. Peter was crucified upside down so far. Uh, that's what tradition tells us. They were willing... Listen, you're not going to give your life if you know something's a lie, will you? No. But they did. And millions have. And they're still doing it today. Therefore, what? Rejoice! All of you who dwell in the heavens. Woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. That's where he, his realm is now uh, among the, the, the ruling of the dead. The realm of the dead. He's filled with fury, though, because he knows his time is short. He's still roaming around, like Peter said, like a roaring lion, trying to find someone who can, he can deceive and pull down. But when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Now who does the woman seem to represent? Church. He's after us. He's still after us, and that's what all these testimonies happening around the world are telling us. It's still going on. It's this tribulation... Remember earlier we said John pictured those who are coming out of? That's, it was present tense. They're continuing to come out of this intense persecution, intense tribulation. It was in John's day and it's still going on and it has been going on all through the centuries. He's pursuing God's kids, God's people. The woman, though, was given two wings. What's that all about? Of a great eagle so she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert. Well, the picture of wings? Well, that goes back to Exodus. Because the symbol of the wings goes back to Exodus where God on eagle's wings was protecting his people. Uh, David talks about being protected by God in the Psalms. Um, he alludes to this by praying that God's wings will shelter him from persecutors and slanderers. Same imagery. Exodus 19.4 uh, talks about God protecting His people on eagles' wings. Deuteronomy 1 also, and also Deuteronomy 32. The same imagery. So it's a picture of God watching over His people. I think I told you that... Uh, when David talks about the wings, I, I really believe that when David brought the ark into Jerusalem, you know the ark did not go to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was over in Gibeah. David put the ark right by his, by, by his palace. He put it in a tent. And for quite a period of time, there's where the ark was. It wasn't in the tabernacle. The priests were going through all the tabernacle stuff over in Gibeah, but there was no ark there. It was with David. And I believe a lot of the Psalms reflect the fact that he had that ark there and there was this ongoing, continual worship. Because one of the Psalms talks about the day and night worship. Like he had almost shifts of people who were there worshiping continually. Kind of a neat picture. 
but that signifies the presence of God. And so here we see this kind of protection through the picture of the eagle's wings. And then taken care of for a time, times, and a half time. That comes back to Daniel. This, this time period that is between the beginning of the church and the second coming is a symbol of that time period in between. When's he coming back? I don't know. Was there a specific sign? No. There isn't. Jesus said so. But there's a period of time where this is all taking place. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. Well, what's that all about? This flood picture. Well, there's, there's three images that could refer to this, and Daniel has some images like this in Daniel 11. There's several verses in Daniel 11 that talk about this. It can refer to an army spreading out to conquer. Uh, it can refer to divine judgment. The Psalms talk about that, the water, the flooding waters uh, overcoming in judgment. Psalm 32, for example, in Psalm 90. Thirdly, the image of the water here as a flood can picture uh, persecution by God's people from enemies of God. And that is also in Scripture several places. I, I don't have, I can't go through all of them. But that idea of the persecution of God's people seems to be in play here in Revelation 12. Uh, Psalm 144, I'll mention that when David says, it's a prayer that God would deliver David out of many waters. I, I mention that because, again, to show you that John is borrowing Old Testament imagery when he's writing this letter. So the, the idea of the flood of waters comes from that picture. But notice the next part in verse 16. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon spewed out of its mouth. Where can you think of times where, where the earth swallowed up? Well, I can think back to Pharaoh. Remember when Israel was caught between the sea and the Pharaoh's army? And they were scared? And Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of God. And the waters parted. And Israel walked over on dry land. And what happened to Pharaoh and his army? swallowed up. And that's the imagery that's used to describe it in Exodus 15. They were swallowed up. Uh, remember Korah in the Old Testament who rebelled against Moses and said, we don't want you as our leader, and they challenged him. And what happened to Korah? They were swallowed up by the earth. That's the picture. The imagery that God is using. God can use those things uh, to help watch over and even protect his people. The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring again. That's talking about the church. Those who what? Obey God's commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus. How do we overcome? By the word of God and the testimony we have in Christ. So the bigger picture is this conflict here. The rest of her seed, of course, again, is the church. So the woman is really a picture, a composite picture of all of that. Um, all right. I thought we could start 13, but that's not working out, is it? Took a little more time than I probably should have with that. Question? Comment? Picture jump. Satan could not stop the purpose and promise of God that was given way back in Genesis, okay? Couldn't stop it. He tried. He tried even to get the little baby Jesus put to death through Herod. But he couldn't stop that. This is the picture John wants to see because don't, right there in the center of chapter 12 is what? This is the issue that's important. Now have come the salvation. We rejoice because we are free in Christ. That's good news. Our enemy is, is done in. He cannot take us. And do not think that anything in this world 
can keep you away from the love of Christ. Romans 8, right? What can separate us? What can? Nothing. No power on earth, no power in heaven can separate you and I from the love of Christ. Okay? So we don't need to worry about any of these crazy scenarios that people are trying to come up with. That has no bearing. The picture John is giving us is one that composites all of the message of God through Scripture and through history. And that's what we're going to get into again in 13. We haven't got to the bowls yet. But in 13, we're going to see how the beast works. How does the enemy work through history? Well, he's going to work through the powers of anti-Christian governments, anti-Christian religions. That's going to be his thing. He's going to use all of that. And he's going to mimic God's working, what we know as the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's going to mimic with the beast, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth, and the false prophet. He's going to mimic all of that. That's what you're going to read about in chapter 13. He's going to try to, to masquerade uh, as a false uh, picture of what God did through Jesus. Okay? Okay, well, we didn't get to 13, sorry, but it's there, so we're ready to go, which we will get to next time.